Okay, let's get started. I want to welcome everybody today to our webinar on navigating the demographic cliff and planning for enrollment shifts. Um, we're excited to be here with you all and we're going to just jump in so we can respect everybody's time. I'm Megan Brewster. I'm a director of impact strategy here at the Sorensen Impact Center. We are located in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we're housed within the University of Utah. And today I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Meryl Schwartz and Kamal Atkins. Uh, Meryl joins us as an expert in higher education governance, program development, research, and consulting. Most recently, she led AGB's content strategy, and she's worked with institutions on forward assessment, restructuring, and equitable student success. She earned a PhD in higher education administration and leadership from the University of Maryland, and she focused her dissertation on the success of academic presidents. So she's got a lot of deep, deep knowledge in this field. Um, Kamal, also, yep, Kamal also joins us today from AGB, where he leads efforts focused on institutional strategy and transformation, including enrollment management, student success, uh, strategic planning, and crisis management. He served in senior positions at five different colleges and universities and holds a doctorate in education from Delaware State University. Um, I wanted to share a bit more about the MAPS project before we turn it over to Maron Kamal. So the MAPS project is based here at the Sorensen Impact Center with funding by the from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The MAPS project exists to chart, chart the shifting landscape of higher education, um, look at a lot of the macro trends and pressures that are affecting colleges and universities at this time. Um, our work focuses on bringing high quality data tools to decision makers, such as board, boards of governors, and it also focuses on bringing the perspectives of students into the conversation as co-creators and the future of higher education. Um, and the MAPS acronym stands for Model, Analyze, Prototype, and Share. Uh, most recently, our team released a product a product called the STEP tool, which stands for Student Trends and Enrollment Projections. We'll be mentioning that a bit more. I know a lot of you are already familiar with that tool as well. Um, but for now, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Meryl, who's going to speak to us a bit more about the context that we're going through. But first, set a little bit on my end. So most of us have heard about this term, the um, demographic cliff. So we know it was most, most recently and most famously coined by Nathan Graw with his Higher Education Demand Index that came out a few years ago and essentially predicted an overall national level 15% decline in student enrollments based on the fertility drops in the number of 18-year-olds that would be um, available to attend college and university starting in about 2025. So we've um, studied this work as well, like many of you have, and found that this um, projection actually is optimistic in a lot of ways. So what we're seeing from our end is basically you can see these kind of three trend lines um, that that are based on all what happens after webinars like this once we actually dive into the space to, to act as university leaders. So if systems are bad, things could get better. If the status quo, things could um, continue to get worse. And if more competition, more pessimistic than this model, things will continue to grow. So either way in this, we're looking at some enrollment drops, but we also know that those are not gonna be spread equally across the country in terms of regions, in terms of sectors, or in terms of types of students. So I'm gonna pass it to Meryl to speak a bit more about the context that we're all facing currently. Thanks very much. And these are trends that have been in place for many years. We we know who was born 18 years ago and, yeah. and so on. So these are uh, hard facts that have been creeping up on us and uh, have been now dubbed the demographic cliff since there was a, a, a point at which we were quite sure the changes would, would happen. Uh, but then there was that pandemic too. So I'd like to uh, talk about three mega trends in college enrollment. And I thank my colleague, Lisa Foss, who's an AGB senior consultant who wrote an article about this in Trusteeship Magazine, uh, Today's College Students, What Boards Need to Know. The, the first trend is that the market is the traditional so-called traditional undergraduate market is shrinking and uh, Megan, you described that well in terms of, we know who's in high school and who's coming out. The undergraduate market is becoming more diverse. The population of the US is changing and the undergraduate student market is becoming more segmented. It's not just the high school uh, graduates, but a, a variety of other students with other needs. And we're going to dig into each of these in a, in a little more detail. Next. So Nathan Graw, as Megan uh, mentioned, has been well recognized for studying these trends and being able to give us a handle on what's going on. So this map shows the changes in high school graduation 
uh, from for the last for 20 years, including projecting up to 2032. You can see in the uh, red and orange areas, that's where populations are declining. I know the numbers at the bottom are small, so I'm going to help you with a little bit of color cues. And the areas in light blue and dark blue are where population is growing. So it's not um, that everything is equal. There are parts of the country, uh, Northeast Rest Belt, where we know there are uh, out migration, lower population growth uh, in areas uh, more in the West and in the South where there's some growth in population. So you have to know what's going on in your area, what's your region, what's your institution facing in, in terms of these changes. Um, I left out uh, our friends in Alaska and Hawaii too, which are at the, at the other red extreme of, uh, of decline. Uh, next, let's take a look at the changes in the high school graduation uh, rates from 2012 to 32 taking a look at race and ethnicity. So this adds to that picture, the, the greatest increases in blue are for Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander populations and the declines in red and orange are for black and white populations, mostly in the east and in the west parts of the country. Uh, so this adds a, another dimension to understanding change. It's not just in one direction, up or down. There's also a lot of uh, change in who's going to college or who's graduating from, from high school. Thanks. Next slide. <clears throat> These trends were uh, exacerbated by the pandemic. They hit community colleges especially hard and will continue to impact the higher education sector in the years to come. Colleges and universities will need to rethink their recruitment strategies and their support for students as these populations continue to change. It's not just the same students in the same places, it's a changing student demographic and shifting in what the potential college students are and not just high school graduates. Next. Uh, to highlight these changes, enrollment for Black and white students declined in numbers, and enrollment in Hispanic and Asian students is increasing, but still hasn't recovered the losses due to the pandemic. And enrollment in Blacks of Black students in community colleges declined by 44% over the last 12 years. That's a really big change. Next slide. This graphic from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation shows how students have changed. And um, I work with governing boards, so I particularly am concerned about those five words when I was a college student. Mm. You, need to, you need to help board members think about what are college students <laughs> like today? What are you really um, enjoying in terms of your uh, diverse student population and who might be the uh, potential students in your area. Um, if you look at the, these numbers are very small, but we are going to share the uh, slides with you afterwards. 39% Pell, 62% working full or part-time, 40% enrolled in two-year colleges, only 53% are what we call the traditional 17 to 21 year old age range. 56% women, that's a trend that's been uh, going on for a while. 28% of children of their own and only 41% live on campus. So when you think about support for students today, you need to be aware of their financial aid needs, their um, uh, child care needs, the timing of classes if they're working. There's so many things that are different for students today. Next, um, when we think about the trends that can't be changed, I don't want you to, you know, I don't want to be the depressing part of this, pop, this presentation of what we, we can't change anything about what's going on. There are things, we, this slide says demographics alone are destiny. There are things that can <clears throat> really influence these trends, 
uh, by value by demonstrating the value of a degree, the relevance for personal and career goals, and by providing the support that makes a difference for students, where students can see themselves in the opportunities that they're offering, where you have touch points and um, connect to students in meaningful ways that help them envision their own success and the, um, help guide them in choosing a career, in choosing what are now talked about as guided pathways. And I think that Kamal will be telling you more about that too, and can help in increasing the uh, likelihood of success. And I was reading an, an article uh, in Prestige Magazine today that talked about all of these guided pathways and the real difference it made when high school students enrolled in college courses as dual enrollment, got guaranteed admission to community college, had a pathway that guaranteed acceptance into a four-year degree program if they completed the two-year degree uh, in good standing and increase the enrollment of the four-year institution that was partnering to receive it. So we'll, we'll give you some more examples of where and how, but these are uh, important ways that you can help manage enrollment and that boards might play a part in the strategy. And Dr. Kamal Atkins will lead this part of the presentation. Kamal? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Meryl. And uh, Meryl did a, an excellent job of, of setting up some of the challenges and the issues related to enrollment management uh, with regard to the demographic, the demographic cliff and those other factors out side of the numbers that have an impact on enrollment and present challenges for colleges and universities uh, and the boards and the and the leadership that's responsible for guiding those institutions. So we want to talk about today, I want to spend some time talking about uh, the board's role in enrollment management, uh, offering a work, working definition of enrollment management, providing an, over, uh, an overview of strategic enrollment planning, which is essential to uh, meeting the challenges that are presented in today's, uh, in today's higher education landscape. And then, uh, and then identifying a few questions that boards should be asking uh, the leaders at their institutions with regard to enrollment management. So we'll start off with the boards, governing boards and enrollment management, where we have a, a four, a four essentials that I, I like to call them, uh, is that board must understand and recognize that en enrollment as a component of institutional enterprise. We often have the conversation, or well, there's also the, the often the, the, the discrepancy between um, the conflict between people talking about higher education as, as a business uh, and it's while higher education is not a business, um, there are some similarities between higher education and business, especially as it pertains to uh, the, the enterprise. One, uh, higher education must focus on improving its product. And those products are the, the education, the services, the development it provides uh, for students and the, the impact it has on uh, the economy around the institution. Um, they also compete for market share, compete for specialized workforce and its faculty and its staff. Uh, higher education must also uh, support employees and adhere to sound uh, financial practices and to ensure institutional sustainability and vitality. Governing boards should also understand that en en enrollment management in relationship to the college or university mission. Uh, if you'll find in many college and university mission statements, they include references to students they seek to serve. Uh, these references oftentimes, or these students oftentimes, inc oftentimes includes a wide range of students. Uh, they tend to prioritize access, and they also talk. Uh, they also speak to uh, supporting students with different backgrounds and abilities. And they should be uh, focused on uh, focused on enrolling students that and providing them with the support uh, they need in order to graduate from the institution. So stand a reasonable chance of graduating from the institution. So uh, with our, when when we think about the the demographics that you just uh, that you just saw and heard uh, heard heard uh, in Merrill's presentation, uh, the 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 student demographic at the institution uh, may have uh, may may initially been been founded or established to serve, and may have may have shifted or changed over the course of these last several years in, in particular. So colleges and universities should go back and revisit their mission statement specifically as related, particularly as it relates to the type of, of students they're, they're charged to serve or they're founded to serve and make any adjustments that they may need based on uh, these, uh, these dynamic changes in the higher education 
landscape. Uh, governing boards must also understand national trends, not just national trends in uh, in in, in enrollment and, and demographics, but also in the offerings that institutions uh, pro provide for students and the community, the facilities needs, um, the support that faculty and staff need uh, on college and university campuses, where the workplace and the workforce is going, um, not only now, but also in the future. And governing boards must also have a knowledge of institutional data and should use that data to inform their, their enrollment strategy. So again, not just focused on uh, the, the data of, of the students, but including uh, it's the data related to the finances and what uh, and, and, and the, how those finances are tied to uh, students that are enrolled at the institution, how to support the facilities needs of the institutions and other services that uh, both students, faculty, and staff um, also need the institution. Next slide, please. Defining enrollment management. Uh, I, I mentioned I want to offer a working definition of enrollment management, which is a, a comprehensive process for achieving op optimal institution outcomes for students in the areas of recruitment, retention, and graduation rates. And this is done through an, an integrated effort of all the university's programs, the practices, the policies, uh, and the planning that goes into uh, focusing on enrollment uh, of, of students at the institution. Oftentimes, enrollment is used synonymously with the term uh, recruitment, and, and the thought there is it limits the, the focus of enrollment on the first the, the, the students who have been brought in in that fall in that fall class typically uh, your first time or your traditional freshman students we like to think about enrollment management and enrollment as as um, the entire process of of not only recruiting students but supporting students throughout their matriculation at the institution and all the policies programs and practices and the planning efforts that support uh, the the student enrollment management efforts that take place on campus next slide please The benefits of en en engaging in the enrollment management process and student success, it benefits by the institution by providing a comprehensive uh, channels for effectively and strategically blending these campus operations, um, oftentimes um, that work in isolation. We, there's, I continue to have conversations on campuses uh, that, uh, that, I, that, I, that, I'm, that I'm engaged with about various departments working in silos and the need to break down some of these silos. Uh, we like to talk about we like to talk about breaking down these silos and uh, integrating these strategies and, and effectively uh, moving these channels forward as building uh, an enrollment management culture uh, at the institution. And in that culture, everyone sees that they have an, have a role and a responsibility for student success and, uh, and, and thus enrollment management at a college on a college university campus. Next slide, please. Strategic enrollment planning. The, again, these challenges that uh, that are presented by the, the demographic cliff, uh, the 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 declines in enrollment that have been impacted by uh, by the by the COVID nineteen pandemic, and the questions about the return on investment of, of a college or university education. Um, requires that uh, institutions become much more strategic in their efforts uh, to attract, retain, and graduate students. And so, uh, the enrollment strategic enrollment management, strategic enrollment planning re refers to this complex effort that connects the mission of the institution, its current state, so the the current market share, the resources it has uh, has available to them to attract and retain and support students, the changing environment. Uh, to to look toward long-term enrollment and the fiscal health of the institution. I want to focus on the last uh, th four words, written plan of action. It's important that these efforts result in a concrete written plan of action. It still amazes me uh, how many how many campuses how, how many campuses um, that I work with uh, have very little uh, uh, in terms of a written plan for annual enrollment or strategic enrollment planning, which is uh, which has been around for a while, but it's still a, a, a new effort uh, at, at a number of institutions. But institutions are seeing because of the, the number of challenges that higher education is facing now, that there is a need for 
a strategic enrollment uh, plan. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide here outlines the process of strategic enrollment planning. Uh, one of the the, the key uh, the, the the key uh, efforts uh, related to this the strategic enrollment planning process has been discussed earlier on in this presentation is the focus on data, uh, specific data that identifies again the the, the internal uh, the internal picture of the of the institution as well as the external factors. Uh, which which include enrollment projections, again, the institution's current market share. And so in the creation of a strategic enrollment a strategic enrollment plan, uh, the uh, that that first phase requires that there's a prioritization of the activities, programs, and the initiatives uh, that that have been successful in helping to enroll enroll students. Those activities include uh, the the travel of the of the admissions officers and recruiters the on-campus programs like campus visits and uh, open houses and admitted student days, for example, new student orientation, all those types of programs and initiatives that are focused and targeted targeted to the populations and audiences of students that the institution uh, strives to enroll. The implementation of these plans employ, employs the best practices and methods and procedures that will help an institution achieve its goals. So. Uh, that's again. That's where data is important to be able to monitor, and measure, assess, and evaluate what those practices are that help that are essential and uh, are effective in helping the institution achieve its enrollment goals. Uh, the systematic inst integration of these uh, of these practices focuses on uh, the university's continue to plan and and is committed to the planning process and making adjustments. Uh, to the strategies that uh, that they that they implement and the practices that have been implemented to determine again assessing the 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 efficacy of those of those of, of those strategies and those practices and that that becoming a part of the process that the institution is engaged in systematic continuous improvement and and what's a uh, one thing that's essential here is that uh, there has to be space for an institution to fail if you will. Um, that some of those strategies may not work. So, you, so there's a there's a there's a there's a space where uh, those strategies, um, if they if they don't work, you move those, replace those for something else, or uh, increase a focus on those strategies that that have been effective in improving your enrollment outcomes. And then the linkages, linking out uh, link the linkage of ongoing planning to institutional strategic and budget planning. Uh, this actually makes the breaks makes the plan itself comes to uh, come, come, comes to fruition and it becomes more actionable. Strategic, the strategic enrollment planning process should not be separate and apart from the rest of the institutional planning that takes place. It's, it's comprehensive. It should be integrated with facilities master planning, for example, the institution's overall strategic plan, uh, the budget planning process, plans for staffing, uh, in the in the classroom with faculty as well as outside of the classroom with staff that uh, that help to operate the institution uh, plans for engagement with the community, for example. So it's an integrated process um, as well as a as a as a, a systematic process of identifying again those best practices um, that influence enrollment of of students at your institution. Next slide, please. Characteristics of a, of a strong strategic enrollment plan is that it's futuristic. Again, it starts to look toward the future. So uh, you, a, a part of that process, though, is uh, examining the historical data that you have at the institution, identifying trends, and then also looking at where, looking at the, uh, examining the information um, uh, about the changes that are taking place in the higher education environment, especially with students, uh, their decision making. Uh, their interests as, as it relates to uh, careers and academic programs. So again, um, using a, a, a hockey term that's, that's used off of a skate to where the where the puck is going to be. Uh, again, it needs to be comprehensive and integrated, um, data informed, uh, oriented um, academically. So so the, the strategic enrollment plan includes uh, includes academic programs that uh, that exist or may be established at the institution to meet the demands of the market and then technolo technologically current. Next slide, please. 
the board's responsibilities again in, in strategic plan is to understand the difference between uh, the, this difference among net tuition revenue enrollment revenue and the discount rate these are the the aspects of the uh, of the the enrollment process that influence a student's decision and i should, should say include a parent's decision as well because we know parents have a lot of influence quite a bit of influence on where decisions where students decide to enroll in college um, so that they, they need to understand uh, the, these uh, the difference between and among um, these um, these various tactics um, that that are used in the enrollment process. Understanding the importance of the campus facilities I mentioned before, uh, what facilities the uh, integrating or linking the strategic enrollment plan uh, to the fac the facilities master plan that the institution has. What we talk about in, in, in enrollment, we oftentimes talk about, especially when I was on campus, I'm talking about facilities that created a wow. Uh, when students stepped on campus, the residence hall, which they're concerned about, the dining facilities, the athletic facilities, uh, smart classrooms, uh, spaces for students to be able to uh, to to uh, collaborate on academic um, on academic projects. So, thinking about those those uh, those facilities on campus is, is extremely important um, to your strategic enrollment planning processes. Understanding the real realities of goal setting and institutional capabilities here. I'm really talking about goal setting with good data in mind. Uh, we we don't want we the institutions uh, oftentimes uh, need to put in uh, need to put in some work to determine uh, what the goals for enrollment should be. What what needs to uh, what what enrollment will help sustain the institution with tuition revenue, and what the institution has the capability of of doing uh, to support its enrollment efforts and to support students uh, on campus once they're enrolled. Monitoring the impact of the program offerings that the institution has. And this is not, not only the academic programs, but again, uh, the program to support students while they're matriculating at your institution, as well as the programs uh, that are a part of your uh, recruitment efforts at the institution. And this is this the fifth one, again, is critical uh, to, uh, to, to this process, supporting leaders to make tough decisions. Um, not every uh, pro every practice or idea is going to work, and, and 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 leaders have to make tough decisions when allocating allocating resources for budgets, uh, for academic programs, for staffing support, uh, for uh, leveraging scholarships and other institutional support to influence uh, students' decisions uh, to attend their attend attend their colleges and universities. Next slide, please. I'd actually love to ask you a quick question before we move to your last couple of slides. I know you mentioned so about like the, this culture of enrollment management. Do you have an example of an institution you could share with us that you feel like is doing that well? And or maybe what you've seen in those that are doing it well, what's making the difference in the board being proactive about this versus, um, you know, kind of not, I guess, at this point? Yeah. Uh, Morgan State is, a, is an institution that I often refer to um, when, uh, when, when, I, when I think about an institution that's been successful, Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, mm -hmm. that is um, that has been successful. Uh, we started engaging it with Morgan State back in 2018, so prior to the pandemic, and they've actually they've made some some great adjustments since the pandemic. But at that time, uh, I remember the conversations with uh, the with the senior leadership of the institution and the board of trust and and the board of regents you know, there in Maryland to discuss the direct, the future direction of the institution. So there was a lot of engagement um, with the board and the senior leadership at the institution about uh, the assets of the institution, the needs mm -hmm. of the students, but also the needs of the uh, the needs of the, the community in Baltimore, the state of Maryland and the region that it serves. And in doing so, they, they, they um, established a really, a, a pretty um, ambitious plan of increasing, so they're very, very specific. Within a ten-year period, they wanted to increase their uh, their their net tuition revenue by ten million dollars, so generate an additional ten million dollars uh, in net tuition revenue over over a ten-year period, and achieve an enrollment. And they identified that they, they they in order to do that, they need to achieve an enrollment of ten thousand students, and so mm -hmm. um, so. And we looked at every student population. That institution looked at every student population uh, in doing that. The 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 traditional uh, the traditional freshmen, the transfer students, adult students, 
and made a made a made a substantial commitment to online education uh, mm -hmm. and started to leverage partners um, in doing that. And as an as and as an institution, uh, they uh, developed or established a division of student of excuse me, a division of enrollment management and student success that uh, that uh, organized itself to serve students from the very beginning of the enrollment process uh, through uh, admissions and recruitment, financial aid, records, uh, transfer students, academic support, uh, and, and basic services. Uh, and, and most recently, they, they've, they've created a one-stop uh, shop to facilitate, mm -hmm. the, a, a provide a customer service um, unit, if you will, for uh, that, that would help students, again, from the time they, before, uh, before they enroll on campus, once they arrive at campus, uh, uh, up through graduation, to be able to connect students to resources. And uh, every step along the way, the, the board asked uh, strategic questions, probing questions, supported uh, the work of the institution, supported the leaders in making those hard decisions, and also worked uh, with, the, uh, with the legislator. Um, the, with the, legis the legislative body of of Maryland, uh, where uh, again I mentioned that facilities are important. Uh, Morgan State has received uh, almost a billion dollars, close to a billion dollars of of um, of, of state appropriations to uh, upgrade the facilities and establish new facilities on our campus. So it sounds like having a clear vision and then making sure that was integrated, like you've mentioned, has been really part of the key to their su success, as well as looking ahead, like you said, where, where the puck's going. So yeah. thanks. That's a great example. Um, OK, great. Back to you, Kamal, for a couple more um, pieces of advice. Yeah. And some and some questions for boards. Again, at, at, at AGB, we emphasize um, boards asking uh, probing questions that uh, that that help to uh, to 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 generate thinking. And, um, and and also inform them, help them understand um, the challenges and the opportunities that um, that uh, that are that are ahead for the uh, that exist and are ahead for um, their the, the universities that they that they're uh, that they're serving. Uh, what is the so re related to strategic enrollment planning? What is the positioning strategy or the brand? So, what is the institution known for? How is how is the brand being used to position? Uh, the institution in the marketplace. And that also relates to the students that it serves. Uh, what information is do, do we have about the brand that provides this competitive advantage? Uh, college and universities um, must uh, continue to, to um, differentiate themselves from um, other institutions that are uh, that are their competitors. Students have a lot of choices um, there. So what differentiates one institution um, from another? Is it the service? Is it the culture? Uh, the, is the academic programs, is the outcomes for students, uh, how they, how students manage the transition um, to different learning modalities. And I can use the, the example of, of Morgan State, uh, with, uh, which made a commitment to um, online, uh, to, to, to expanding online learning opportunities uh, for their students or remote learning opportunities for their students. And having a sense of who's involved in recruitment processes and what, are, are there adequate staffing levels and are the, are the staff members trained? Um, that is, uh, I, I think institutions certainly should pay particular attention, uh, not only from a board perspective, but also from an institutional perspective that there are a number of, of the, 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 the marketplace has changed, the demographic shifts, the environment has changed. So how, how, how are the institutions, are you supporting your, uh, for reporting staff to uh, be aware and knowledgeable of, uh, of of recruitment of the best practices that exist um, now, um, and 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 are there this, uh, are there at high enough levels to or do they have the capacity to provide the support they need? Uh, how can your boards focus on enrollment uh, and student success? So again, the retention element, the component, but this was supporting students throughout the process. Uh, from again recruitment to matriculation and graduation at the institution, and what issues related to student success can be handled operationally, and uh, what needs uh, strategic input from the board. And uh, we oftentimes quote our, our, our president uh, of uh, AGB, who says, uh, essentially, what's the appropriate level of oversight? Noses in, fingers out. And so there's a, a specific de a delineation between the roles of the board uh, and, and helping in the strategic realm, um, as opposed to getting involved, getting involved in the operations of the institution. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I know in our work, we've talked to a lot of um, board members as well, and it seems that 
there's quite a variation in terms of how folks are thinking about this, how proactive they're being, and, and then how it diffuses from them down to the rest of the institution too. So it's great to hear a couple examples as well as um, that there's basically a really clear framework that AGB has put together about how you can start tackling this um, and then do this in a successful way on campus. So thank you. Um, we've just got a couple more slides. I wanted to just talk about how the MAPS tools can support some of the strategic planning that Kamal and Meryl have spoken about. So um, over the last year, the MAPS team has produced three different tools that are designed for decision makers in the higher ed space. So board of uh, board members, as well as president cab presidential cabinets and other senior leaders. The first is the financial health, health dashboard. This provides basically visibility into looking at different institutions, how they're arranging their finances and this, the decisions they're making about investments and things. So you can look on the dashboard and see peer institutions, aspirational peer institutions, and understand what that really looks like when it comes to revenue and all these different factors that are gonna affect um, enrollment management on campus. The second is the institutional equity outcomes dashboard. So this um, tool uses data from iPads to basically provide color and um, insight and visibility into what's happening on campus in terms of student success from a disaggregated view. So I know we've talked to some board members who know those numbers like the back of their hand and other folks who are sometimes surprised to hear that there's a lot of different equity gaps in terms of their student successes in terms of retention, access, outcomes, um, jobs, and things like that. So this can help gain visibility into what's happening on your campus and you can also look at peer institutions as well. And then the third tool is the student trends and enrollment projections um, model, which I briefly mentioned earlier. So the greatest value of this tool is being able to see historical population and enrollment data, but also population and enrollment projections through to 2030. So we've had a lot of talk about what's changing in this space. This tool helps to bring some actual trend lines and things um, to that based on using a data science model and then historical data as well. Um, it also covers a couple interesting factors related to college going behavior, including the, the role of online education, as well as how students are making decisions around flowing in and out of different states for their education. So together, these three tools can really help um, boards understand who their students might be in the future, um, if they're serving them well right now, or what they could do better there, and then if they have the financial capability to work on that in the future and kind of help make an argument for how they can better use their resources going forward. So I think I kind of talk to these a little bit more, but here's a little bit more of what the actual step tool looks like. So you can see that you can choose a state, you can look at a lot of different levels of in terms of specificity for different populations. So you can look based on um, sector as well as then student gender, student race and ethnicity and a couple other factors. And you can see the trend lines there as well as the, the map. Um, and then you can also see what's happening in terms of um, how students are making decisions about in-state versus out-of-state school. Obviously, this affects different sectors in a different way. Um, it's interesting to see what's, what states are sending students to your state versus where your state is exporting students to in terms of the college landscape. And then finally, looking at the role of online engagement. So we, we all have a lot of knowledge about that post-COVID, post I think, but there's interesting some trends that were already happening um, with schools like Kamal mentioned that have been really proactive about making that a part of their value offering. So um, the key takeaway in a lot of the maps work we've done this past few years is really that the colleges and universities that will thrive in 2030 will be those that ensure diverse student success. And like uh, Kamal talked about, that's not just about getting folks in the door, it's about making sure they have the support, the capacity and the, the clear pathway to then get through their degree and, and then earn a value from that credential going forward. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I actually think I'd love to kick it off to Meryl and Kamal if that's all right. Um, and then you can just drop questions in the chat as well for those who are here participating. So one of the things I'd like to hear about more, so Meryl, you've mentioned that um, this, this thing about, oh, when I was in college and tried to getting board members to update, they're thinking about some of this. So what have you found that's been really helpful in getting board members to understand the experiences of students today and the students that are continuing to increase in higher ed versus kind of the experience of students in the past. And um, that seems really important as we think about the value off offering and then enrollment as well. Oh, that's a great question. The idea that um, the composition of the board matters um, can also mean holding up a mirror to the board itself and saying, what's missing? What, how do we compare to the students enrolled in our institution, the communities we want to serve? And are there perspectives, voices that are missing in our own numbers? And um, encouraging boards to take advantage of uh, committee membership to augment those voices right away. Those might not be voting members of the board, but provide in the committees that do the most work, the perspectives of um, 
of others who might not be on the board and then longer term being able to influence board composition. The other is um, looking at it as an ongoing long term education of the board and including in board meetings, plenary sessions. One of the you know, greatest compliments of our own board was hearing after a board meeting, we love our board meetings. You always help make us smarter. So mm -hmm. bringing in plenary session speakers for issues that address current but also future issues for the board, um, having students who are uh, representative populations that may have a success gap on your campus, talk about what matters to them in terms of their own success, what challenges they have, uh, being able to hear uh, the difference it made to be able to get childcare on campus. Uh, the needs of during the pandemic, we heard a lot from uh, college and university boards as well as foundation boards about the um, impact of emergency aid for food insecurity, mm -hmm. housing insecurity, that gap between when you got the financial aid award and today. You know, mm -hmm. things changed really rapidly over that period of time. And, you know, uh, uh, the, the comment at a meeting I was at recently that, you know, there's a big segment of our students who are one flat tire away from dropping out of college. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, small, small emergency fund grants can make a huge difference. Being able to hear from students directly about what their uh, student experience is, what, what needs they have that could make a big difference, and how the institution and the board are thinking about uh, student support services. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, great. We've had a question come in. I'll just read it for everybody. I'm interested in whether AGB is seeing any emerging trends or innovative approaches and in what institutions are doing to manage enrollment challenges that other institutions can learn from. For example, are other institutions creating the one-stop shop type of service that you mentioned, Kamal, or how are, how are how's this looking on practice on the ground in terms of um, innovative approaches to enrollment challenges? Uh, I'm certainly seeing more institutions uh, trying to uh, trying to figure out um, and identify different ways to uh, be able to better uh, to, to be able to better um, serve students, especially again through in the through in the enrollment and, and recruitment process. Um, to uh, so they are um, working with another institution in Illinois that um, is in the process of creating a one stop shop um, as well to provide additional customer service. Um, some other things that institutions are doing is again really focusing on. Uh, the points of entry at the institution uh, and different types of students. So seeing the growth and the focus on or increase in the focus on transfer students in particular, oftentimes mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in, the, in the fall, in the, 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 the recruitment cycle, the fall uh, uh, student, the fall focus is oftentimes on the uh, traditional freshmen again. And, um, and then they, and, and oftentimes the transfer are a, an afterthought. And so, mm -hmm. Um, institutions, you know, I encourage institutions to uh, to think about the transfer student population as well. Um, we do know that uh, students are moving around from institution and to institution more, and so there's some opportunities in that market. The adult student population uh, and uh, students, and I'm saying more institutions, um, engaging in uh, re-enrolling students who have stopped out, and so they're they're identifying students. Uh, maybe five years um, removed from the institution or 10 years removed from the institution or in different cohorts that have stopped out in good academic standing that they're uh, reaching out to uh, and recruiting to come back um, to the institution um, as well. Um, there was a, a, a report, I believe it was last year, that um, identified about 30 million um, people uh, in the population have some college, but so that's a a great um, population to work with. It's hard to identify them outside of your own, outside of one's own institution. But those are some of the things that I see uh, institutions focusing on as uh, as they're trying to manage the the challenges with enrollment going forward. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great one. Go one, ahead. One data point I would add that um, we we didn't uh, highlight in the beginning was that co of college graduates, more than fifty percent have started their college enrollment at a different institution. So of those who graduate, mm -hmm. more than half started somewhere else. 
So this attention to the um, experience of transfer students is very important for private colleges as well as public colleges. It's not just the two-year, four-year public uh, highway. A lot of private colleges are also enrolling transfer students, and it could be four-year to four-year or two-year to four-year. Uh, but they are looking at relationships with the uh, two-year institutions in their area and understanding the success by looking at disaggregated data for your transfer students can be key to addressing student needs. So being able to ask the question as a board, what's our retention and graduation rate for two-year colleges and how does that differ by different programs can mm -hmm. help you identify, are we in alignment with the institutions from which we're receiving a lot of transfer students? In what majors or programs are there um, mis misalignments where the preparing student, the preparing institution and the receiving institution have different expectations for uh, what the uh, students will know in order to graduate. And those that are asking those questions and addressing them are doing really well. The, um, there's an article on transfer pathways in the current right. issue of trusteeship magazine that gives several examples, including uh, University of Central Florida that's been really intentional about working with the two-year institutions, especially in STEM, to make sure that those, those key courses, those gateway courses, are aligning so that the students get through and to and through uh, for successful four-year degrees. Yeah, that's so critical. We, we worked with a, a community college in Tulsa that was really clear on their transfers and their program-based um, disaggregation data too. And they had what they called their mission and metrics scorecard, which really tracked all that over time. And I think their success was exactly what you talked about, Kamal, which was integrating it across the right folks and having leadership buy-in and then having a really clear way to track that. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, we've got one question about um, any of your thoughts on how the MAPS tools can help in enrollment planning for, for the board perspective or other senior leaderships. And um, I can speak to that, but I'd love to see if, uh, if Marilyn Kamal, if you've got any thoughts on that as well. I love the where are our students coming from and going to in our state. Um, there's, there's a great deal of detail that you provide about uh, student demographics and about flow that I think are really helpful in rounding out the, the picture. Um, so I'll add that. Yeah, I, I, I would echo what, what, what Meryl uh, mentioned is that, that the, the, another source of, of data that, um, that you can drill down um, deeply into and identify uh, specific patterns of students, the student types, uh, again, disaggregating that data to inform uh, some opportunities and 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 help identify strategies that you use going forward to to enroll those students and support them while they while they're at your institution. Yeah, thank you. I think it's exciting to see uh, kind of some more establishment and maturity in the space of of other tools and resources, and definitely the maps um, tools hope to add to that conversation going forward. So. Um, well, great. I know we're nearing the end of our hour, so I'm going to go ahead and um, lead us out here. I think going forward, we'd love any of you all who are attending here to reach out to us and connect on the MAPS project. You can find us at mapsproject.org. Um, we'd also love to have you learn some more from the AGB team in terms of their resources. They've got a knowledge center that's linked here, and, and you can also reach out to Marilyn Kamal by their email addresses, which are linked here as well. So. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I think this continues to be, we, we see a lot of interest in this as we release these tools. It continues to be a question mark as well as a priority for a lot of groups. And then those who aren't already making a priority, we're, we're trying to bring along as well. So it seems like there's good work to be done, and we hope to add to that conversation. So thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We'll send out this uh, webinar as well as, as this data, or excuse me, as the slide deck as well. So, okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.